Hello, and welcome to Go With The Heat, an enthusiast guide to the 1980s cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. My name's Dominic, and joining me like they do every week, my sister, Jenna, and my brother, John. Jenna, how are things going in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area? Well, you know, they're pretty good. Um, just trying to keep cool and keep my head down the summer. Like, we're just ending the quarter at work, so it's a little bit of a like a crazy time. John, what's going on with you up in the uh, Pacific Northwest? Well, I've got a couple uh, cousins visiting, and um, they're up here, and they have a they're vegans, and they have a vegan dog. And so <laughs> I've been learning that there is such a thing as a vegan dog. That is, uh, 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 man. So I'm vegetarian, and I have a recent convert in my house to go vegan. My 12-year-old daughter is now a vegan. And so, I mean, I am no stranger to alternative eating styles in the in in a house. And I don't know about a vegan animal, man. I mean, they don't know any better. Yeah. They, they're just supposed to eat. I didn't know that was a thing. And it just dogs naturally eat meat like that's just you know like i just yeah. don't see how you can feed him vegan it took me a while just to figure out what the hell actually comes in vegan dog food yeah like exactly. i started guessing vegetables <laughs> and, and it was like no there's no corn in there no there's no this it's like well then what the hell are you feeding here <laughs> well wait do they i thought that they were making their dog food now this is getting really weird let's move on <laughs> <laughs> This ooh, week, ooh, ooh. we are talking about Season 1, Episode 7, or 6, however you, count, however you count the pilot. So Season 1, Episode 7, No Exit, originally aired on November 9th, 1984. little brief fact before we re really get started on here. The director of this, his name is David Soule. And this is the only episode he directed of Miami Vice, and, and I'm going to try and give more credit to these people that are directing the TV episodes. He's best known for playing Hutch on Starsky and Hutch, and really? he directed oh, you know this I, episode. I did re read something about that. We're off on a... Uh, you can kind of feel the 70s tinge in this episode of Miami Vice, and that might be why of the 70s cop show style in this episode of Miami Vice. Uh, so let's just jump right into it and bring in the rundown on this episode. All right, so we get another quality, strong start to an episode of Miami Vice in this opening. And we are at, it's kind of like they're at a stakeout, but I think it's its not re really a stakeout, right? It's there, there, they're ready to make a bust, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And Switek, we the first line into it, Switek is again, is he supposed to be comic relief? Question <laughs> mark. <laughs> I don't know if you classify All anything I he know. says as being funny. Why is he All talking I know. so obviously into his into his mic though? Yeah, like that. It was seriously bothering me. All I know is that he says it's 102 degrees. It's 7 a.m. This is the least sweaty the series has been <laughs> uh, in its entirety. <laughs> That's so true, actually. <laughs> when I heard that it was 102 in Florida, I was thinking like that must be hell on earth to be 102 in Florida. I mean, it's like you have to imagine yeah. like it's 102 with like 80 percent humidity. You know? Yeah, it's like, exactly. <laughs> right. It's amazing exactly. they're not just and like so able to cut the air. Yeah. And as soon as they said that, I started looking at them and I started realizing no one's sweaty. Like, how is this happening? Yeah, well, the only ones that look sweaty, the only one that looks sweaty was Tubbs. But I think that's just what he looks like naturally. Is that yeah. he's just yeah. always kind of glistening, you know? <laughs> that's his, that's uh -huh. his Tubbs glow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, on this bust, they're like, Crockett, want, want, once again, is the uh, undercover agent. They're setting up to buy some uh, some artillery. Well, some grenades, actually. Grenades, at the last minute, yeah. Yeah, at the last minute, before they get thick off, they think it's going to be a bust, which, first of all, they're in an area where there's nothing but old people. And it was actually, I was thinking for a second, where it's like, hey, this is actually they're actually showing old people like they haven't really done that in any of the episodes yet. It's like, but this is primarily an old people's area. Like they're acknowledging the retirement aspect of Florida. And I can so relate living in Phoenix and all the old people uh -huh. fucking everywhere. Do you also have creepy old uh -huh. men walking up in full suits and watching the people do their workout <laughs> on, the, on the, the park lawn? I was, at, I was at Costco this week and I saw an old man just, just walk in. He walked straight in, walked up to the hearing center and asked him to look in his ears and then he left so if you ask him <laughs> if old people do weird shit in arizona <laughs> well that wasn't i mean that's not 
like, yeah, okay, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I'm talking creepy. <laughs> like, I don't know that look in my ears is creepy. I mean, I guess you, like, you could totally make it creepy, but. Anyways, they, in this scene, they're, Crockett's going to make the buy. He says he doesn't have the money, which is interesting because they're trying to make a bust right so it seemed like they should you know he should have the money they're going to close this deal and then mm-hmm. one of the guys he pulls out like a a, a pistol or a, like a uzi out, out of his belt and then the police rush in and it turns into this massive shootout as the van just takes off and the back doors flip open and in the back of the van is like a mounted m60, it's an M60. <laughs> machine gun yeah <laughs> So Crockett, and it, yeah, and they the just dude. start unloading. <laughs> well, yeah. Croc- Crockett tosses one of the dudes into his car and like backs away. And the guy's just unloading, like just unloading into the cars and the crowd all around. Tubbs like grabs a lady and jumps and and ducks for cover. So did you notice? Did you notice that the van drives off? No one chases the van. Everyone just gets up and starts casually walking around. Tubbs, Tubbs has got that like Tubbs is out of control. He's got like one eye crossed, and he's like shaking, <laughs> drooling a little bit because he's so angry that someone was shooting a machine gun at him. And Gina's like laughing at him, and Crock is telling him to calm down. There is a terrorist with an M60 <laughs> mounted to the back of a van driving around Miami, and no one goes after him. No one. I, no I mean, one. That, he that just drives off. Florida. <laughs> that feels very Florida. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like like. They, it happened, and I was like, well, that's his right as an American. And then, okay, <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? I'm watching it. I'm watching it, and I'm like, he's getting away. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but here's the thing. So that guy unloaded that M60, right? Nobody was hurt. So no. at this point, you have to wonder if that guy's even a threat. Like, maybe they're just like, let, let him go. He can't hit the broad side of a bar. We're good. <laughs> yeah, he's not a threat. It's a all good. heavily populated area with people who have trouble moving quickly, and he can't hit any of them. Uh, yeah. so, Nothing to see here, <laughs> folks. It's just Tuesday. <laughs> I mean, from the camera angle, do you see where he's shooting? He's like lighting up every car on the side of the road. <laughs> and it's just like, it's just gone. <laughs> see ya. Well, well let, we, let's fast we, forward now. Yeah, we, we, we roll through um, the credits and we get back to the precinct. And in there, just briefly, they're interrogating the one guy that they caught. And he gives them a couple names. There's the guy's names, uh, the guy's names that were doing the deal. Their names are Gentle and Ramon. Sure, <laughs> if your name's Gentle, I got you there. And, yeah. But they're really doing a deal as part of someone named Tony Amato, who's going to be our bad guy in this episode. They want, they ask for Castillo to get, you know, that, that way they can go bug all his place and, and his phone calls and everything. And Castillo recognizes the name. So we just burn through the precinct. We get to, so the next scene, they leave from there, they're going to go set up all this stuff. They grab their, they grab Lester, the um, the tech guy that, that sets up all this stuff. And they mm-hmm. run off to go to Tony's house. So we jump to Tony Amato's house, the main bad, the main villain in this episode, who is none other than the Bruce Willis. Yes. Which, possibly the greatest action hero ever. It, yeah. I mean, if you ask me, like, Die Hard is the greatest action movie of all time. Sec- I mean, the closest thing to it is Predator. That's the only thing that comes close to Die Hard. See, and then you say yeah. shit like that, okay? You have such a strong start. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I have three words for you, Jenna. Oh, sorry, four. I'm going to give you four words. Get to the chopper. All right? <laughs> uh. <laughs> there, There is... Almost certainly a video around the internet of me trying to say that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when we see Bruce Willis, it's like the most 80s thing, right? Pink house, pink brick. He's got, I mean, the clothes that he's wearing is the definition of 80s. And it sounds like you both have some information on uh, Mr. Bruce Willis because this is really his first acting, you know, his first TV role he's he's ever had is in this episode of Miami Vice. Well, wait, just I wanted to comment once on his house because it reminded me and refresh my memory on the name of the movie. But it's a one of the Chuck Norris movies that we watched where he has like a compound. Do you uh, know? Do you remember which one be, I'm talking about? Because it reminded be, me so much of that house. You're right. That might be the hero in the terror. That might have been. It might be that one. Or what's the one in San Francisco? I think it's the one in San Francisco. Okay. All right. I'm gonna have to look that one up. So okay. what's nice 
this episode is I got a chance to learn more about Bruce Willis. He's actually some a uh, very interesting guy, being that he, he was born Walter Bruce Willis. So I just want to stop for a second and uh, realize he does not look like a Walter. <laughs> no. no, no, but I, I kind of want to call him Willie. Wally? <laughs> yeah, or Wally. Uh-huh. Wally Willis. <laughs> Speaking of nicknames, his high school nickname was Buck Buck, which I'm going to enjoy. From now on, he is going to be known for, in my eyes as Buck Buck. He was also born in Idar Oberstein, West Germany. Uh, his dad was a soldier, and so now I'm kind of interested to see if that Pulp Fiction story about the watch is actually true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Every time I see him now, I'm look at, be looking at his wrist like, what kind of watch is he wearing? I mean, because uh-huh. there might be some truth. It's like that first time you see a picture of Hunter S. Thompson. And there's a real picture of him in 1974 or whatever it was when Fear, Fear and Old in, in Las Vegas was written. There's a picture of him in Las Vegas standing in front of a white convertible. And you're like, like oh, my God. Like, that story might be real. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then a little bit more about Bruce Willis. Uh, his dad was a soldier, and then uh, after the war, moved them to Jersey. And uh, he worked a couple different odd jobs before New- becoming an actor. By the way, moving to New Jersey from East Germany sounds like a downgrade to me <laughs> somehow. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so he had a few odd jobs working at a nuclear power plant and a few other things. <laughs> yes, very strange, very strange. So, but he actually one of his last jobs before he started acting was as a private investigator. He can would you, then can go you just get a job at a nuclear power plant with like no skills or <laughs> or ed- like advanced education or Appar- anything. Apparently, all he did was drive workers back and forth. Yeah. So he didn't do anything really okay. important. They have regular yeah. jobs, too. Like okay. Non, right. Non-nuclear engineer jobs at a power plant as well. I mean, I'm not going to go to New Jersey yeah, to validate to that any of this shit's legit. I, I like, guess. I just have to. <laughs> I'm concerned. Jenna, someone has to clean the toilets. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds like um, someone tried to play up their LinkedIn profile. I worked at a nuclear, <laughs> at a nuclear power plant. Uh, like, you were the fucking janitor, or <laughs> isn't that uh, what the whole story is in Star Wars Episode Seven? Like, that's that's what he yes, that's his only in on the on the base is that he was uh he was oh a yeah he was there. a garbage yeah. garbage oh, man. Yeah. So. Bruce Willis was a stage actor. He started uh, acting as a stage actor in Miami Vice. This episode is actually his first film role, uh, movie or TV. And then he would do a few other guest spots, including the first revival of the Twilight series, before eventually landing a lead role playing a private investigator on the TV show Moonlighting. He won an Emmy for that. Yeah, yeah. So. And, you know, there is a, a a theme here, though, that anyone who appears on Miami Vice, there's, they, there are one of two things. Either A, they're somewhere in their background that they have like, in their role. They also did that in real life. Or B, they go on to have a music. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I should say. Oh, Bruno's Bruce, a crooner. Yeah, Bruce, <laughs> Wally. Wally's got both. He's also the private investigator buck, buck. in his past. It's 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 Buck Buck. Yeah, and uh, he's also a singer. I mean, how did what it sounded controlled like. herself around him? Is any wonder <laughs> really? Jenna, explain to me what that set would have been like with both Don Johnson and Bruce Willis on site. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I, I have to imagine that there was a lot of coke and no panties. So. <laughs> I mean, they're both, they're both singers, you know, so they're uh, serenading people on set. Well, I feel like maybe he was prepping, like, we'll get more into his role on this episode, but he was prepping for his 1989 album, If I Don't Kill You, It Just Makes You Stronger. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta imagine that Bruce, Bruce is maybe like a like a method singer, so he's <laughs> too too in the zone to get to get anywhere else. Oh, <laughs> uh, did you guys get that like wise. late Elvis vibe? You know, the fat Elvis kind of sound there. 
All right, well, we got to start moving on because we, 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 we got to get on to the rest of the <laughs> wait, episode. Wait, 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 wait. There's one more song that I feel like we must talk about. So Bruce, known for his many solo albums, uh, also did a number of guest appearances, one of which in 2008 was on a Blues Travelers album um, with the track titled Free Willis. <laughs> Oh, ruminations, ru- ruminations, <laughs> ruminations from behind Uncle Bob's machine shop. <laughs> now, Blues Traveler with Uncle Buck Buck on the banjo. Okay. The, re- the reason why they're all there. So we got Lester, we got Sonny and Tubbs, and we got uh, Zito is there. They're all there. They wait for Tony to leave. They wait for Buck Buck to leave. Buck Buck and his crew leave, and they they break into the house, and they're gonna go bug all the phones and and, and every room. The only thing I've note that happens Which, in by, this scene, wait, just a top notch alarm system. I mean, it takes them a whopping ten seconds to disarm. Well, yeah, that's that's gonna be my only talk on this book be, before we moved on. Is that they have thirty seconds that once they break into the house to go disable the alarm, but they don't know where the panel is. So in thirty seconds, they feel around on all the walls. Find the hidden panel, open up the panel, strip back the wires, and splice in a machine to loop it through so it so it so it stops the alarm in thirty seconds. That Lester yeah. needs a I race. Mean, yeah, Les- <laughs> Lester's better than all of them. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking he's of a, which, it, is that any of this legal? Um, yeah, yeah. So they say in the precinct. They said they asked Castillo to get permission to go get a warrant. That way they could bug his house. Okay. So we're just assuming that in between then and when they went and did that, that they actually did get permission from a judge. So one thing that caught me was um, (laughs) that – Tubbs has to remind Crockett when they're looking through that, like the gun magazine, or mm-hmm. it, it's it's like a what does he call it, like a Sears robot catalog, but for ordering guns, yeah, um, and uh, and other like potentially illegal, assumably illegal things, and he just leaves it on the dining table, and Tubbs is like, ooh, you should probably put that back where you grabbed it, so. Well, go, that's, that's the theme throughout this whole show that we keep talking about every week, that they're like the worst undercover cops. And even in the beginning scene where they're all staked out wait, waiting for this deal to go down, they all have headphones and the cord like hanging from their neck. You know, and right. they're like, it's all uh-huh. old people and they're just mingling in there. Like, and then when they, when they bust people, they like come sprinting in and two thirds of the people that they're trying to bust get away. They're like the worst undercover yeah. cops ever. Exactly. Let's recap this episode so far. So far, the van with the giant machine gun drives <clears throat> off without a- anyone caring. And then immediately after this scene in which they plant the bugs, they're on a stakeout and they start arguing with the FBI outside the stakeout outside yeah, of yeah. tony's house so, yeah so after they, like, set they it are all just up, the worst so after sorry. they set it all up sunny's boat is parked out in the water outside of tony's house and then that's when that's what you're talking about the fbi show up and the fbi is trying to say that they have jurisdiction over this investigation and they just started they start arguing with the fbi right there on the boat no identification needed and like like apparently no one you know tony has uh, not going to notice a bunch of people yelling at each other on a boat uh, yeah. next to his house so the FBI come, they work it out. They say like, look, you guys do the surveillance, but the FBI is in charge of the investigation because they, they're they tracking Tony as part of some other thing that they won't talk about. There's they, And what comes out of it is one, sorry, there's one thing that comes out of it that they, there's something additional that you feel like the FBI is not telling uh, the local police force. But then it also turns out that Tony is involved with a theft of missiles fucking missiles from the national armory so stinger missiles from the national armory and he's mm-hmm. trying to sell them and that's why the fbi are involved to get this so that there's this agreement between the fbi and miami vice that Miami vice will lead the uh the investigation when it comes to like the bugging of the department and listening in on the conversations and leading that role but in the end the fbi is the one that's in charge of the investigation and will make the bust and so they're there yeah. all day and then that night is when they finally start to hear conversations from inside the Amato household. And this is really weird conversation or not conversation, like where, where we learn that Tony Amato is, he's like abusive to his wife. And there's this really uh, uncomfortable scene where he's yelling at her and he's like 
telling her that she's stupid and that that she doesn't look good in the dress that she's wearing. And then he says, like, I'm not going to wait. I'm tired of waiting for you. And he pushes her into the pool. And they're all just watching it like it's primetime TV. They're all they're all like glued to the to the little telescope or whatever. And I'm just kind of curious. Has Buck Buck ever played a role in which he was happily married? I can't think of any Bruce Willis. I think in, I think he is divorced or getting divorced or estranged in every single role he has ever played. The, the yeah. ten yards, the whole ten yards or whatever. Him and Ama- it's Amanda Pete that he gets within that, right? I don't know on that one. Yeah, but they're, he's a, they're pretty he's, happy in number two because she's like all gung ho about being. But they're both they're both hired killers in that, so they're not exactly. <laughs> well, what um, is that? to do with anything you asked if they're married i, I, I guess one? i see it your is. point i i see you all right i see your point he, he's not divorced or estranged in that so okay well that aside that aside <laughs> we learned that night that obviously tony amato is just a douchebag and he beats up on his wife and that and crockett's taking that exceptionally personal and then we also learned that tony's got a meeting with a guy named he's not 100 sure of his name he, his name ends up being dupass or dupass or however you want to pronounce it he's jamaican and tony has never met him seen him or talked to him which at first i thought maybe it, it's actually already set up with tubs but it turns out it's a real dude and they're just going to replace the FBI, there's a FBI agent who pretends to be Jamaican, and so that's the plan as of right now. The FBI is going yeah, to put so their person in. The and FBI. So, so. And, that's, and, that, and that's all in this very next scene. We go back to the precinct, uh, and there's discussion over what to do with Rita, who is Tony Amato's wife. Tony Amato was beating her up, and one of the last things we hear in the scene where they're, where they're doing the stakeout on Tony's house is her calling a friend. And the friend asking if she wanted her to set her up with a quote unquote meeting, which totally sounded like she has a connection with a hired hitman and that would kill to- to- Tony Amato. So when we get to the scene, they're having a discussion. Crockett and Tubbs are on the side like, we have to step in with Rita. We have to stop this because it sounds like she's going to have him killed and that's going to mess up our investigation. Meanwhile, on the other side, and the FBI the- is saying, hey, don't worry about it. He's fully protected right now. Let's not get sidetracked and keep our focus on Tony Amato. Yeah, the FBI are perfectly fine with his wife hiring someone to kill him. Um, yeah, and we well, find out later why they're so comfortable with his wife uh, hiring someone to kill him. Yeah, well, I mean... <laughs> In the end, it kind of turns out that Sonny was okay with the dude being a hired gun, too, because he just lets him leave. But that's <laughs> yes. that's later. <laughs> the last thing that we learn in the precinct, though, in this scene the precinct, is that thing. is that they have Nick Cannon works for the FBI, and they're going to have him go replace Dupass as the Jamaican contact with Tony Amato. Because Tony doesn't know what he looks or sounds like, they can do that. But right at the end, they just Tubbs is able to convince him like, hey, how many uh, undercover investigations have you done? He says he's on a couple and they decide to instead put Tubbs in his place and have Tubbs be the Jamaican contact is, to buy these stickers. Because, yeah, and, and Tubbs selling point is his awful Jamaican accent. <laughs> yeah. FBI agent Paul can't go undercover because he can't pretend to be Jamaican as good as I can. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> so quickly, over the next scenes, we have we go to the airport. Switek and Zito and Tubbs all go to the airport. They make they capture Dupass and Tubbs takes his place. He gets in the car and one of to- Tony Amato's guys takes him to his hotel. They I don't know why he Tubbs when they did the switch when they captured Dupass then Tubbs took his place that they felt like that Tubbs had to wear the same clothes as Dupass, especially because they don't know what they don't. Uh, I don't know. I don't get it. But Tubbs is dressed exactly like Dupass. <laughs> so that was mysterious to me. Method acting. It's like <laughs> yeah. he's method like- acting. He's got to dress like him so he can channel that fake Jamaican accent. <laughs> on. So they. So now Tubbs is in. He's their contact now. Zito and Switek are following Tubbs, and we have a brief scene at the boat where so Tubbs is off doing this work where he's getting inside of Tony's uh in, inside of this deal where Sonny is still mo- he's still on the stakeout he's still on his boat which is you know i guess good for him cut because he lives there he's still on his boat parked outside of tony amato's house and he is still listening in on the conversations we briefly hear rita she's on the phone with her friend saying yes okay let's set the meeting and, the, and they set it up so now Sonny has heard that rita has set up a meeting with this contract killer so let's jump straight to that rita meeting with the 
with this hired gun. Crockett goes, is so, that like some open area? Just like you said, he he shows up and he happens to bump into the uh, hired gun first and Crockett scares him off. Doesn't arrest him, just kind of shoes him away, shows and him his badge. The guy that they chose to play this hired gun, if there was a definition of greaseball, this would be the guy that you would <laughs> use as your example. Visual re- representation in your mind. Just picture greaseball in Florida clothes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they just took one of the grips off the set and said, hey, just walk <laughs> in and just look serious. Yeah, and then leave. Yes. He looks pretty paranoid for being a, a contract killer as well. Like, he's standing there and he's kind of, like, looking around, got the sketch eyes, like, maybe he's tweaking a little bit. So as soon as he sees the badge, he's like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Not only he mm-hmm. sees the badge, Crockett's like, he's just looking at him, he's like, beat it. And the guy just leaves. Yeah, and one thing that I noted was that so Crockett reaches into his pocket and then pulls out his badge. And in the next scene, when he walks over to the wife, he reaches into the same pocket and pulls out his smokes. And that jacket has very small pockets. So I have to wonder how he fits both of those things into one, and it doesn't look super bulky. It was just really distracting for me. I just have to imagine he's got, like, his badge, his wallet, his smokes, a small grandfather (laughs) clock, his gun. It's like a Mary Three bags of chips. (laughs) Like a a Mary Poppins uh, jacket. Crazy. Yep. A couple containers of mints, some patchouli. So he's beat. He you know he's rocking the the patchouli oil. Yeah. He tells the the, the the hitman to beat it. He goes and talks to Rita, and he pretends like he is the hitman at first. And we hear this, like, this is what Miami Vice is good at, right? Where they hook you in with the story and because there's, like, so many, it's, like, multi-layered stories of, like, how bad this guy really is. And mm-hmm. the, we hear this story from Rita, and it's just like, man, it's tough to get through. But she's saying, like, she tried to leave Tony. She tried to leave Buck Buck, but he, like, went off into a rage and so she went to meet with a lawyer and the lawyer was like, no, I got you back. We're going to help you. You have the right to a lawyer. And she's saying that Buck Buck was telling her that she can't have a lawyer. And so then he hired some some of his goons to go stalk the lawyer and his wife. And then to make a yeah. point, he had the the uh, people stalking his wife. They, they raped her and then used that as a warning to tell the lawyer to beat it. Like, what yeah, the he fuck? He threatened to also have them rape his daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, the episode gets all kinds of twisted right there. It, you know, Real it's all dark. of a sudden it's like a uh it just gets so bad it's like, "Oh my god." Like, really? Yeah. Yeah, man, it was dark. Like, holy shit. Like that, and I understand like it was dark already because it's like you see Tony, he's like beating mm-hmm. up his wife and stuff like that, you know, and they're like selling these hardcore guns. And then this just like it just takes it up a notch. Like how bad it is. Yeah, like I was expecting I was expecting them to go like the goons to go beat up the lawyer. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Not like rape her and then threaten to rape her daughter. Like, like, holy crap. Well, this meeting ends with Sonny telling, finally telling her that he's a cop. And, well, sorry, before this, yeah, she backs which, out. She, she says, like, I can't do it. And then he's like, that's good because I'm a cop. Yeah. Yeah. And he trusts Tony's wife, Rita, a lot by telling, he basically tells her everything. We, we, we're bugging your house and we're going to arrest your husband. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, I mean, he puts a lot of trust in Rita, someone who just tried to hire a an assassin. So they they we have a brief scene at the precinct where they bring her in and they they do the full rundown on what's happening and they're basically telling her that they got her back as long as she's willing to help them out some. Not leave, not make sure that there's you know, so he's not suspicious of anything going on. Just live your life like normal and Everything's going to be fine. We're going to get them arrested. That way you don't have to deal with them anymore. So now we go to the where Tubbs is going to meet with Amato and meet with the guys who stole the the stingers from the National Armory. This is And this, this is, is probably my favorite scene. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. This is this is an amazing scene. So Tubbs and Amato and the couple goons are come driving up and gentle the guys are names are Gentle and Ramon. They're there on the beach already. They're the guys that are driving the van in the very beginning of the episode. It starts off strong because one of the guys is just standing at them. He's waving them down. And Tony's guys just drive right past him. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh-huh. right past uh-huh. him, right? They stop. Everyone gets out of the car. And Gentle and Ramon are like, if you were to take stereotypes with over the top comic relief and put them into two characters, those are these guys. Like, after every time after one of them says something, they go, oh, yeah snap snap clap clap and they high five each other whenever they whenever they say something uh-huh. <laughs> and so dude this is also 
like so then you've got Tubbs Tubbs horrible Jamaican accent. Tony and you got Buck Buck like showing him the missiles and we find out it's Buck Buck's discount weapons cuz he's selling these missiles for $75,000 a piece. Like everything yeah. must go. <laughs> um, yeah. It's the fire sale, uh, people. <laughs> and he's telling him uh, and he's telling Tubbs about how you can shoot down a plane with the missile without the missile exploding. Yeah, so that's what these two guys, Jake and Ramon, are telling Tubbs. Like, yeah, you can shoot down a commercial airplane with one of these things without it exploding. So it looks, so it doesn't look like it was a bomb that went off. It looks like it just fell out like a mechanical issue. And then which, they're also which tell brings the, the yeah they which also brings tell the, the story. Me, well, which brought up the question to me at the time. I actually wrote down: Are they there to shoot down a plane? Yeah, like, is this yeah. about? Are they about to blow up a plane? Remember, these are the same guys. <laughs> Who drove away in a van with an M60 mount on the back of it? These dudes are terrorists, and they're still yeah. like they're still roaming around. I mean, you, I think you guys are just you guys are thinking this through way too much. <laughs> All right. At one point in the scene, I, I thought I saw a plane in the back. And I'm like, there it is. They shoot down that plane. We yeah. should be respecting their rights to defend themselves. Okay. <laughs> well, well, the Buck Bucks discount weapons. <laughs> <laughs> we got grenades. We got missiles. We got machine guns. Well, we also buy a machine gun. Scene. Get a machine gun free. <laughs> We also <laughs> learned in this scene how they got them. So, and I, I wasn't sure. Did Gentle Ramon say that they are they work for the National Guard or they they were just there? I think they work for the National Guard. That's what I have down. What their story is is that one day they were there at the National Armory. They work for the National Guard. A pizza came, and the guy who guards the door for the for the all the equipment leaves to go get the pizza, and they just steal. 10 stinger missiles and some m60s that's the story on how they got this i mean yeah. seems legit well you know it <laughs> seems like the one thing that the national army wouldn't protect against is domino's delivery drivers <laughs> yeah and then <laughs> to make these guys even worse criminals right they're willing to sell to the first person that they run into that says that they will buy them no questions asked well he's trustworthy because he's jamaican well that's this scene ends at night where they go get a couple drinks to talk about the the last of the deal and Tubbs finalizes that they're going to sell them all for like 67.5 or something like that is what the total ends up being. Then there's going to be delivery later. We leave from there after Tubbs make to, makes the deal to buy them. Go back to Crockett's boat. And he's still listening in on Rita at the house. And this is yeah, when... That, I- Tony comes home this is when from, you, from the deal. Yeah, and you kind of get the idea from Crockett that he's kind of fallen for Rita, which is, seems kind of strange considering, like, other than talking to her the one time, all he's done is just spy on her. Well, I think it's shown in the history of the show so far that Crockett will basically do anything for a skirt. Right? He's just a really good guy, you guys. Yeah. He's not yeah. creepy <laughs> at all. <laughs> it's because he's got such a bleeding heart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, this this scene is another one of those super dark ones because so Crockett's there listening in. She's hiding. Tony comes home and Tony's like, like they did a good job portraying him and, and Buck Buck does a good job too. It's like that as a true abuser, right? He comes home, he's got a gift for her. So like hot and cold, right? He comes mm-hmm. home, sometimes mm-hmm. he's really nice and then he, then he flies off the handle really easily. She asks him about that wife, that couple with the lawyer and he like flies off the handle again. And uh, she, he starts beating her, and Crockett's got to listen to it, especially after. So he's on a stakeout, so he can't jump in. And then, especially after he convinced her to go back yeah. to help them out. So, mm-hmm. and this is where we get our first real song in the episode two. We get Teddy Pendergrass "Stay with Me" playing while Tony's beating up his wife. So pretty dark <laughs> stuff from there. So we jump from there. We go back to, to the precinct, and we have a short co- co- conversation here about the FBI. They want to go in there and bring down... They they make it sound like they're not going to go after Tony at all. Now that the deal has been struck, they want to go get Gentle and Ramon and then go get those missiles and get them off the street, but they're willing to forego going after Tony, which the duo, our crime-fighting duo, is like, like no, we, we need to get them all. We have a meeting set up already for noon tomorrow. Like, we should, or they're supposed to call me to mm-hmm. set up the meeting at noon tomorrow. We should bring them all down. And it's just fishy because it seems like the FBI knows something about Tony that they're not willing to share. Oh, I, and like I said, earlier in the episode, they kind of didn't give a crap if Rita was going to hire someone to kill him. And now they don't want to arrest him at all. 
you're starting to see that the FBI really, really just doesn't want to involve Buck Buck in in anything. So they're they're gonna wait. It ends up that the FBI concedes they're gonna wait. They're gonna bring down everyone. They're gonna wait for that call at noon tomorrow. We go back to Crockett's boat. Tubbs and Crockett and uh, Lester and I think Zito might be there. They're hanging out in the boat. They're listening in. Amato gets a call from one of his guys who's like basically has a stakeout on Tubbs, who's supposed to be do pass right. He's the guy that that's making the deal to to buy these missiles. He calls Buck Buck and tells him, hey. He never came back to the hotel and he left. I don't think he's coming back. I think he skipped out on our deal, which is really weird. Like, again, like they're like the worst undercover cops, right? Like Tubbs should be there. They're waiting for a call until like for noon the next day. But then he just doesn't go back to the hotel room. He's on the boat watching the stakeout. Yeah, it's kind of weird how it all shakes out. It almost looks like it's like they do it on purpose, but it's very clumsy how they do it. Like you would think he would go back to the hotel and not the boat. Yeah. Um. But for some reason, this panics Buck Buck into making the call to move up the deal. Buck Buck gets mad and he throws the phone down. And when he throws the phone down, the wire or the bug on the phone comes out and he sees it and he puts it together like that he's being monitored. And so Tubbs, <clears throat> out of desperation, gets the phone, calls Amato and plays it up like, hey, I'm I'm out because it, cops are following me and this is your fault. And what's really weird at this point then and it starts to dawn on me is that like, man, Tony Amato is desperate to sell these missiles. Like he is overlooking so many things. He is so desperate to sell them. And I have no idea yeah, why I he's mean, so he, desperate. He literally just found out that he's being bugged and everything is looking like the cops are onto him. And yet all that makes him want to do is accelerate the meeting to sell these missiles to a guy he has no history dealing with. They're able to end that conversation. Amato says, we're doing it in an hour. Go meet me at the same place we picked you up at, which is the airport. They do it, and everyone scrambles. Tubbs goes to the airport. Tony comes and picks him up there. We have a very awkward scene in the bathroom where a guy's like finished going to the bathroom and Tony and Tubbs are in the bathroom like to talk about the deal. And T Tony just looks at the guy and he's like, gives a head bob. The guy's like, oh, I guess I ain't washing my hands. So he just walks out of the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you need people to leave so you can aggressively frisk your friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they frisk each other. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, they frisk each other, and then that's there's a, a that's brief some argument. That's senator level airport action going on. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even wait for the shoe tap, okay? <laughs> yeah, I, I was gonna say, I thought you're supposed to wait for the double shoe tap to start. <laughs> <laughs> they just go for it. There's a brief. Might I so add, once a, uh, once again, we see we get a chance to see how desperate Buck Buck is to sell these weapons. Yeah, because they have a brief argument, and then. Uh, because Tubbs saying, like, I'm out, man. It's, the cops are onto this. And he's like, No, you gotta say, you gotta say, I gotta sell them, gotta sell them. Let's go do it right now. And you're right, like Tony's mm -hmm. super desperate to sell these missiles. So we leave from there and we go to the we go to a dock, which of course we, that's yeah, where we start away and we're on a boat. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> and of course, it's I mean it's Miami, so it, where all the illegal activity goes down at the port. And you would think that the that there'd be a special port division of the Miami Police Department just to handle all the crimes that are going down at the port. You know, kind of uh -huh. like what is in uh, the second season of The Wire. <laughs> like they should probably have cops down there just for this. So they go into this old boat. The missiles are down below, and there's a couple guards for Tony. They're up on top and they're guarding the door. We have a great song playing in the background. We got Phil Collins. I don't care anymore. Playing. And Swooning. we have got Don Johnson, action hero, climbing up into the boat. Tarzan's over to a rope ladder, climbs up, runs around behind barrels and stuff. It was like something out of a video game, right? Like the guys who are the guards, they're like uh -huh. the dumb guards in a video game. Where they're like, did I see something? Oh, it must have been yeah, nothing. Well, and what's, walk off. What is, what's funny is that at this point in their respective careers, Don Johnson, not buck buck bruce willis is the action star yeah and so the question i i guess is who is the better pop star because i i think at this point don johnson is what bruce willis is aspiring to become well we might have to have is, like a like a is that season, weird we might have to have like a season wrap-up where we where we go through the different co-stars and their musical <laughs> their musical acumen <laughs> and, and do some comparisons because i feel like that that's going to take some more conversation than we've got right now yeah. in, in true miami vice fashion here's how here's how the episode's gonna work 
coming up to the end of the episode. Tubbs is there. He's going to finalize the deal. Tony shows him the missiles. Everything looks good. T- uh, Crockett's sneaking up on the guards so that they can make a bust. Everyone's in place. Everything's good to go. The my, the FBI come pulling up and just announced on the loudspeaker, FBI, everyone put your hands up. They're not even on the boat. They're just like, <laughs> the, the cars aren't even stopped. <laughs> it was like they were uh-huh. yelling it into the CB as it is the loudspeaker as they joked on the street. FBI, FBI, FBI from like miles. <laughs> they've just been doing it the entire ride over <laughs> yeah. well, I imagine, because i'm sorry you, you think you wouldn't have, announce they're at one of those you think bridges. you wouldn't announce that you are coming to people who have stinger missiles <laughs> yeah the last time they dealt with these guys there was an m60 mounted in the back of a van here come the fbi agents who have no siren they're like <laughs> into their little speakers that come down the street. Can you just imagine they're at one of those bridges that goes up, like it, like it, you hold there, so the bridge can like break in half for, or like split in half for uh for a, a boat to go through. Yeah. And they're just sitting there, and they're just like, <laughs> like just, waiting, just waiting for the drawbridge to go back down. So of course it's, it starts to shoot out. Crockett and Tubbs are the only ones that are worth anything because one of the one of the models guys turns around, shoots one of the FBI officers. Crockett shoots one of the Tony's guards who fall, then falls into the water. Tubbs captures, he he shoots or he like... Uh, judo kick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, judo kicks the guy that's down there with them and then gets Tony at gunpoint and they, and they make the arrest. The FBI does nothing except allow one of their guys to get shot. Uh, and so they make the bust. <laughs> Buck Buck is shocked he, when he tells Tubbs, he's like, I didn't know you were a cop. Yeah, that's the shocking part. Right. Yeah. Well, we get to, you know, now we're close enough. The F- Rita get, get, gets a call saying that they got him, that, 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 that they arrested him. And now we have our duo escorting Amato to the courthouse, which I didn't know that was the first stop on an arrest, that they just escort you straight to the courthouse. Well, wait, that couldn't have been. They, they're they all dressed differently, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, it's the next it's the next morning, it okay. looks like. So they're escorting him to the courthouse. Mm-hmm. But another group of people show up and say they have papers to get him released, that he is not, that he can't, he's not going to be charged they ask you know tubs and, like who are you and the we FBI, don't know cia and they never say I R S. Yeah. <laughs> you don't you don't need to know and we don't need to show you any badges just let that convict go <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and at that time rita is pulling up and getting out of a cab C- castillo gives in gives him the key they they undo the cuffs on tony and uh again it's because Tony's got connections higher up and they're using him for, for access to, to another thing, which is exactly what we felt like earlier in the episode. The FBI wouldn't give the Miami Vice all of the details on what's going on with Tony Amato. So now we have one of the rare episodes. We have here's how the, the, the episode flow has gone when it comes to the main bad guy escaped. Dead, 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 escaped, dead, dead, escaped. <laughs> right. uh-huh. So. Now, so now they're they are they're releasing Tony. Rita comes running up to the top of the steps at the courthouse, sees that they're releasing him, and she she pulls out a gun. It's like you can't let him go, and you see you we have a focus in on Crockett's face. He goes no, and it freeze frames, and you hear the gunshot, and we have, and that's how the episode ends. Does he die? Who knows? Yes. Yet another family torn apart by the Miami Vice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because. Yeah, I mean, you know that you that... think they'd start they'd start checking their witnesses for guns. This seems <laughs> yeah. to be a reoccurring theme. Now you know, she's um... gonna go away for life, and Bruno's probably just got like a flesh wound. Well, you know? I, yeah, that's what I was also saying. Is like, so... who knows what happened, right? So we're supposed to use our imagination, mm-hmm. right? But like, it's who knows how many times she's fired a gun. You couldn't tell how close she was to him. If any of the other cops did anything, like, did she shoot a police officer? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, right. yeah, exactly. So a little bit more, uh, when I did a little research about it, one of the things I read was that, like, this episode and their constant shots that they take at the FBI and CIA in Miami Vice is it was meant to criticize Reagan's President Reagan's involvement in South South America at the time. Oh, yeah. And so and, and so this is like like with CIA or whoever they are coming to get a motto. They're like trying to play it as they're going to use a motto and let them off the hook so that they can figure out who's selling these weapons from from south america uh, but it's okay. all meant to, it, it's all meant to kind of be a criticism of president reagan at the time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. interesting yeah that's 
That's. I mean, so. I don't know enough. I I know what you what what you're talking about, but I don't have enough knowledge on the names of the programs. I mean, Reagan had all kinds of programs that were designed for you know part of that mm-hmm. war on drugs uh, that was happening yeah. in Central and South America. So hey. I mean, yeah, but that it, means it that makes George sense that H. a lot w. of times was probably the one that made the directive to keep them the, to, to release a model then. So we, we, we see that they continually make the FBI or CIA, they, they continually make them look like they're devious and just underhanded in the way that they approach other law enforcement. Yep. Yep. Well, that closes out this, the seventh episode of season one titled No Exit. And uh, let's get on and talk about the music in this episode. All right, John, this is pretty much your segment. So we have two songs that were in this episode, The uh, which seems like man, we just keep getting less and less music. Although this this episode's strong. The music, even though they only use two songs, the two songs are great. Jenna, me and you can both agree that anytime you have Phil Collins in an episode of Miami Vice, we have hit perfection. Absolutely. And so now we have, in this episode, we have two songs. We have one from Teddy Pendergrass, and we have a classic Phil Collins song. What do we got in store for us in music here, John? So what surprised me is I'm actually going to talk less about Phil Collins than I am about Teddy Pendergrass. Okay, let's end this music conversation. Let's move on to our closing (laughs) thoughts. We're we're clearly not aligned as a family. Okay. (laughs) No, no, just just hear me out here. Just hear me out here. So I thought, obviously, as soon as I heard the Phil Collins music, I thought this is where I'm going to go with this segment. And so I'm looking at it and Phil Collins, I Don't Care Anymore is the name of the song. It's featured from the album, Hello, I Must Be Going, which also is the same album with In Air Tonight, which is like classic Phil Collins song. Classic. Classic. And the, the, the... the song itself is a song about Phil, the collapse of Phil Collins' first marriage, and mm. it shows a lot of his anger with the with how his marriage ended. And well, so the song goes right along with the Rita Tony domestic violence. And whoever this woman is that hurt Phil Collins, I I hate her. I hate that she, <laughs> what she has done to him. <laughs> I'm joking. So, I joking. can't, I can't not, hate her because joking. so many wonderful things came out of that. So a few things we can take away from this Phil Collins song is that it was his first Grammy nomination for a song for best male rock vocal. Well, I guess um, I'm being a little generous yet, with the term rock there (laughs) oh and they get even more generous considering it lost to michael jackson's beat it Mm, well i guess i mean i guess if you're gonna classify both of them as rock that's a song to lose to and to be honest with you i don't care anymore isn't exactly the greatest phil collins song because it's like it's a lot of repetition in it you know it's like um you know earlier we had in the air tonight or it's not like rain down on me or, or any of those songs i mean those are those are the classic ones yeah, yeah. And so the other big thing about the song is that it was featured in, in Grand Theft Auto V, which is the Miami Vice, mock Miami Vice version of Grand Theft Auto. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Grand Theft Auto Vice, uh, Vice City or whatever. Yep. Vice City. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's on the Los Santos Rock Station. I see. So... To jump to the other song, the Teddy Pendergrass song, and this is why I wanted to focus on this a little bit more, is it's actually crazy. Teddy Pendergrass, at kind of the height of his popularity in the 80s, was in a horrible car accident where he was paralyzed from the chest down. And wow. Yeah, and so this was in 1982 in Philadelphia when he got into when he wrecked his Rolls Royce for uh, so after his accident the record studio actually released two just mixes of songs he had already released just to fulfill his contract with them so dropped two albums of already released material he goes through two years of painful rehab and when he comes out of it he doesn't have a record contract it looks like this might be the end of his career and so he's able to get back into the studio and come out with the album love language which is his first new music since his accident and that's where this song i don't care anymore comes from Oh no! It's um and, the name of the song is different, right? Not not I don't care anymore. Oh, I'm stay, sorry. Stay, stay with, with me. me. Stay yeah, with yeah, me. yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I I miss. I've yeah, gotten yeah. too close together. It's okay. Yeah, we yeah. all get Phil on the brain sometimes. So he that's the the album Love Language in which he released Stay with Me together. That's kind of the resurgence. That's the make or break album kind of that gets him back in the music, which also features a song called Hold Me. 
which features a then unknown Whitney Houston. Mm. Wow. As her break into music, Teddy Pendergrass would go on to make music until the 2000s, all the way up into close to his death in 2010. And there's actually talk right now about a movie coming up, biopic movie, about his his story starring Tyrese Gibson. Mm. Wow. So, yeah, so this, <laughs> this song that uh that they used is off an album that was kind of like this big huge deal that kind of put him back on track as a recording artist after he was paralyzed like it was this big turning point in his life wow. um where he wasn't sure if he was gonna find a new record contract or if anyone if he was gonna be able to perform anymore Mm -hmm. um being paralyzed like it was a really big deal so i was actually surprised i was a lot more enamored by teddy pendergrass's story well you know before this i didn't know anything about teddy pendergrass so uh... and now i've got tyrese gibson to look forward to (laughs) Uh uh-huh and who knew that he was partially responsible for whitney houston so yeah yeah, yeah, that's very cool. And that came on this album. <laughs> well, all right. Well, let's move on to our cl- closing thoughts. All right, y'all. This was a this was a great episode of Miami Vice. You know, we've been kind of hot and cold on on how we feel about the episode. So I'll ki- kick us off here on our final thoughts. You know, I had a lot of fun with this episode. The story, although clunky at times, were things like like the M60 shooting out of the back of the van as they drove down the road and no one chased them and stuff like that. Like all in all, though, it had a lot of subplots and the subplots were coherent with the main storyline. So it actually did a pretty good job. I was really impressed with you know how those all fit together. And Bruce Willis is obviously great. You know, he's he's himself. He's got it's really dark with his storyline too, which is the best parts of Miami Vice is when they get really dark like that. So the Rita Tony storyline and how dark that is has really made this episode all around great. We have very few as far as the vice cops that, that are involved with the story. So we're really focused on Tubbs and Crockett. We don't have a lot of Zwitek, uh, Zwitek and Zito going on in this episode. So we was hyper-focused on the duo that we want more time with. And just the Bruce Willis story was was the, the Tony Amato story was really good. So I was actually re- really happy with this episode. I thought they did a pretty good job. And uh, it's one of my favorite ones so far. Uh, Jenna, what are your closing thoughts on this episode of Miami Vice? Uh, I mean, I agree with you. And I, I think... It's nice to have some of like the lighter hearted fun episodes, but I really appreciate the darker episodes that we've seen so far, um, especially when it comes to Sunny, because I feel like that's when we get the best look into who Sunny as a as a character actually is. So him dealing with um, with Rita, this whole ep- this whole episode was really something that I I appreciated a lot. Um, I thought that it showed maybe Don Johnson's character, like his ability to, to make Crockett sort of a multidimensional. He's not just like some cash hoarding, you know, crooked vice cop or something like that, but he like actually gets really invested and cares a lot. Um, when he apologizes to Rita as she's being beaten after he's told her to go back and he, like, you can just really get that he felt very powerless in that. Um, and to that point, I thought Bruce did an amazing job with this. I'm actually really surprised. Like I, if any, anyone ever asked me like a, an actor who I thought was quality, <laughs> uh, I don't know that Bruce Willis would ever come up on that list. Like he would just never come to mind for me, but the more things that I watch with him in it, uh, the more I realize that he actually does a really good job uh, with playing the characters that he's given. So, uh, and this is no, you know, no different. Um, yeah. He plays like a, a, a hor- horrible person, but he does yeah. a great job with it. Like all the way to the end when Rita's, you know, running up to him and, and he is, you know, surprised to see her and still has that air of like asshole to him. Yeah. That just, you can sense that he, that he was able to still be controlling in that scene, even though she was about to, to shoot him and hopefully kill him. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was really great. Yeah, and I will add, John, before b- before we get over to you, said what is weird for me though is that you know in this modern era of TV we have you know shows that are really we like say like The Wire where you have one villain and it stretches over an entire season. And that's the only thing that I like about modern TV, which is hard for me to get around, is that we get introduced to a villain and then the villain is gone. You know, it's a self-contained. A- 
episode. There's nothing that really happens in this that has any bearing on what's going to happen in the future other than just regular character d- development. Learning more about Sonny, about how, you know, he he takes things personally. But I, I, I'm on the fence with how, how that is. But John, you got a lot more experience with those types of shows where each episode is a self-contained episode. What are your final thoughts on this episode of Miami Vice? Uh, well, thank you. You. And then first to respond to Jenna, Buck Buck is a top five actor in my opinion. I love Uncle Buck Buck. I just think that he <laughs> flies in under the radar. Like he's not someone that's very like he's not widely talked about as being some sort of like amazing actor breaking breaking out and doing all these great things. But he does a great job in the stuff that he's in. I would so. argue with you with Die Hard, The Fifth Element. Uh, I mean, even the whole nine yards and, and being a, a com- comedic role in that one. Uh, well, yeah, and he's, I digress. Been in, he's been in serious movies too, like that, like non like actiony. So like in the Looper, right. 12 Monkeys. You yes. know, he's he's got some movies where it's not an action role, I guess. Uh, pulp pulp fiction. So yeah, ab- absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. So, but I digress. So to get to to Dominic's point, one of the things I I read while researching this a little bit was one of the critics said called this the turning point episode that kind of finalized the overall tone of the series. I kind of that's the way I kind of felt because I think this is a this episode is the perfect example of of the different style formula like Dominic was talking about where there's the one style where there's the bad guy that they're chasing throughout the entire series and then there's subplots each episode as as you go along and this is the other style where it's like each episode contained kind of like a law and order style each episode's contained to its own story own plot own villain you really get a good chance to see the writers and the director you know they get a tackle domestic violence which was you know uh, which is a big issue and they get to take a few shots politically with the whole gun gun weapon running you know and the cia stuff and so they, there's a little politics there's a little heartland issues you're starting to see the di- uh the way they're inserting these stories and encapsulating them in a single episodes so every episode they're going to be able to take some kind of issue or something going on in the news and kind of insert it into that one episode uh, i'm surprised that how far they take it you know i mean with as serious a- as some of the issues are but they do a good job keeping it entertaining as the with the Miami Vice style while they tackle stuff like domestic violence. So, yeah, I guess uh, I, I just I, I like that it's multidimensional, right? It, that they can go from being more lighthearted on some topics but dive more deeply and there's like you were saying and and maybe that's just my sh- shortcoming of not knowing um enough about the what was happening like in the time that they were sh- actually shooting this to understand maybe the those other the the what they're drawing from right like the like the political stuff or mm-hmm. other news stories that would have been more popular there yeah yeah you know and, and Miami Vice just has this unique way of being able to talk about something serious like domestic violence and then in the very next scene have a scene with an alligator on a boat you know? <laughs> so like they they, they they have this ability to be kind of silly and kind of corny but at the same time to kind of tackle serious stuff and be that kind of prime time drama television show so it's just kind of a unique combination because i think when you look at tv shows or cop shows nowadays you either have the serious drama or the comedy but you don't really get too much of a mix of both and i think that's what miami vice is kind of known for yep yep well i mean hard to hard to disagree with any of that that's gonna do it for us this week we uh we thank you for subscribing to the show and listening to us listening to us talk about another episode of miami vice this episode seven no exit a season one uh hope you enjoyed the show be sure to subscribe let other people know give us some reviews send us some feedback you can get a hold of us at go with the heat at gmail.com you can check out our website at go with the heat.com you can also get a hold of us personally on twitter i'm at dom corvo jenna's at jenna a barham and john at corvo underscore John, reach out to us anytime. We'd be happy to talk anything Miami Vice. And again, we hope you enjoyed it. Check out the website. Make sure to subscribe to the show. And we'll see y'all next week. Bye, pal. Bye.